Okay, welcome back from lunch and sunshine. And now uh, we continue with the panel on writing practices. Everyone, please give your attention. So uh, now we have the pleasure of listening to Naomi Rokotnitz. Um, and let me introduce her briefly. She uh, received her BA from Cambridge University, her PhD from Bar Ilan University, where she continues to lecture in the Department of English Literature. And uh, there are books and articles. Uh, the most important article, I think, is Constructing Cognitive Scaffolding Through Embodied Receptiveness, Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye, 2008. And there's a book. Uh, that's going to be coming out real soon. Trusting Plays, a Cognitive Approach to Embodiment in Drama. That's coming out in, from Palgrave Macmillan Press. So we're really looking forward to hearing your talk. Thank you. Well, thank you to the resilient crew who returned from lunch. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, right, so change of gear because I'm talking about literature. Uh, Lionel Shriver's We Need to Talk About Kevin is a work of fiction and does not reflect the lived experience of the author. However, I'll be arguing today that the novel presents a forceful trauma testimony narrative. The survivor narrator is Ava Kachadurian, whose son Kevin committed multiple and brutal murders three days before his 16th birthday. Throughout the novel, Ava refers to that day as Thursday. Although a great portion of the novel is devoted to tracing the events that led to Thursday, it's not necessary for the purpose of this talk to recount the details of the traumatic event, except to acknowledge that Kevin's victims were tortured and mutilated before they were killed, and that Thursday is devastating both to the families of Kevin's victims and the Kachadurian family. Eva describes that day as an apocalypse. However, and I'm quite glad following the previous lecture that I made this strategic decision, uh, I am not going to relate the gory details of the event at all. I'm interested in talking about the post-traumatic processes that Ava and her son undergo in the novel. So let's begin by considering a short exchange between the two protagonists. It's a year and eight months after Thursday. Eva and 17-year-old Kevin sit in a windowless prison waiting room. And Kevin relates how a fellow inmate, in retaliation for being asked by his neighbors to turn down the volume of the monkey CD to which he was listening, murdered the couple in their bed by slitting them from crotch to throat. Eva replies dryly, that's appalling. I can't believe anyone still listens to the monkeys. A few minutes later, when Kevin affirms that he knew exactly what he was doing on Thursday and would do it again, Ava is able to answer with prim sarcasm, I can see why. Gesturing to the room around her, she says, it worked out so well for you. A few moments later, when he says openly, I hate you, she replies, I often hate you too, Kevin. Now, this exchange is not supposed to be a macabre comedy, and it may seem to you aggressive, but in the context of this meeting, such black, straight-faced banter passes for progress. The expression of honest emotion and the establishment of any kind of rapport between these two family members actually marks a significant milestone in a long and painful process of trauma testimony discourse. Shriver's novel examines many issues that lie at the heart of this conference. I'm going to focus on two of these. First, the potential inherent in creating a written representation of traumatic events. And second, the possibility that trauma may be most effectively overcome when its representation is accompanied by a course of action. What do I mean? Fifteen years ago, neurobiologist Bessel van der Kolk asserted that because people who undergo psychological trauma suffer speechless terror, the experience cannot be organized on a linguistic level and thus becomes not only inaccessible but also unrepresentable. And there was a lot of discussion here about that. And yet, as we all know, there are numerous examples of just such representations. 
Naturally, these are subjective and insufficient to fully conjure the horror of lived experience, but they constitute attempts to process, to communicate, and to move beyond trauma. Moreover, as Irini Kakandis claims, there's no possibility of recovering the pre-traumatic self, since the effects of trauma upon identity and memory can rarely be erased. Thus, recovery is best viewed as entailing the creation of a new self. Trauma constitutes a rupture, a severance. We may or may not become reconciled with the causes, circumstances, or perpetrators of the traumatic event, but we cannot undo experience or erase knowledge. Recovery is thus a creative process. This renders representation of traumatic experience not merely testimonial account, but regenerative re-representation. Indeed, more recent research suggests that representing trauma can have comprehensive positive effects. In diametrical opposition to Van der Kolk, psychologist James W. Pennebaker, among others, argues that not only is verbal expression of horror possible, it's the only representational form which has been shown so far to advance therapy. Language appears to be indispensable to the, the processing of experience in a way that leads to both physical and mental improvement. Nonverbal emotional expression, including dance, music, and art, can release tension, bypass conscious resistance, and tap into both pre-conscious physical mechanisms and memories. But such expression must be followed by conscious analysis and verbal commentary if it is to bring about long-term changes. The act of converting emotion into words allows the survivor to create a story that helps to organize emotional effects both the effects of the experience and the experience itself. We all know here again that Dominique Le Capra has argued that working through trauma is an articulatory practice. Psychiatrist Lawrence Kiermaier concurs by asserting that the efficacy of healing relies on the use of language to engage the imagination in ways that give form to incohate feeling. It's not therefore surprising that the results of writing and of going to psychotherapy have often been found to be largely comparable, as both lead to the construction of a narrative, which can in turn be examined and revised. The exercise of constructing a narrative, moreover, creates the possibility for the continuation of that narrative and opening up to future change and development. However, I'd like to direct our attention today towards two other parallel processes of testimony. One takes place in our concrete arena of the survivor's body, and the other takes place in the interface between that body and the environment. Pennebaker, for instance, shows that in addition to its psychological benefits, the narrating of trauma also affects physical well-being, manifested in reduced depression symptoms, radically improved blood markers, immune functions, and lower levels of pain and medication intake pointing to a crucial intersection between conscious linguistic expression and pre-conscious embodied experience in the rehabilitation process. Shriver's narrative goes even further. She suggests that creating a narrative is not always in itself enough. Naturally, neither Shriver nor we are interested in judging the achievements of survivors or in determining one response as more effective or successful than another. Finding words for even a fraction of the traumatic experience may already in itself be a tremendous achievement for a survivor. But such a narrative can remain a private communication between the survivor and his or herself, and risks perpetuating a sense of solipsistic isolation and alienation, reinforcing fidelity to trauma. A recent literary example of this, which perhaps some of you are familiar with, is Grandpa Thomas in Jonathan Safran Foer's Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close. Foer's novel, and even more so Shriver's novel, both suggest that in order to be most productive, representation of trauma must either penetrate the outside world and make a mark, or precipitate, precipitate alternative action that does so. In other words, the painted representation or written text is exhibited or published so that the trauma it recounts, the lessons learned by its survivor, and the implications of its representation are communicated to an audience, whether this be family members or the general public. Or, as in the case of We Need to Talk About Kevin, 
The narrative representation remains private, but its implications are made manifest through actions into the world that affect other people and generate change beyond the confines of the trauma survivor's self. Neither Foa nor Shriver imply that there is a prescribed right way of coping with trauma, but they do suggest that the process of adapting to a new post-trauma reality, the creation of a new viable self, and the possibility of reintegrating into a broader community can only be achieved through an interactive dynamic. In Foa's novel, Grandpa Thomas is only partially rescued from his cyclical compulsive writing by a brief interlude in which he steps out of his trauma to help his grandson. But the survivor who acknowledges his grief and his loss in a way that also allows him to re-enter the world of the living is Oscar. He does so through embarking on a quest which involves travel, that is physical action, and interpersonal communication, that is interaction. In Shriver's novel, the despair into which Ava falls after Thursday is accompanied by multiple symptoms of PTSD, including an inability to share or express her grief. However, after almost two years of fixation with fixed routines and self-flagellation, Ava decides to write a series of self-critical letters to her estranged husband, Franklin. At first, this initiative seems to be an acting out of her trauma by obsessing over every detail that may have led to the devastating effects she recounts in her letters. But gradually, her narrative journey leaves Eva to form a new conception of herself, her family, and the very processes by which self is constructed through a continually involving creative endeavor. The story that her letters end up telling is not the one she had previously imagined, but significantly, a different story worked out in its telling. Shriver's fictional narrative thereby masterfully demonstrates the processes described by clinical research. However, alongside this narrative process, Eva reevaluates the importance of action. Eva's testimony is directed at Franklin, her husband, and is by no means intended for a wider audience. And yet, her transition from private testimony to interactive agency allows the insights gained through narrative construction to impact the external world. By assuming control of the story of her past, she also assumes control of the direction it will take in the future. As trauma therapist Cheryl Mattingly writes, narratives are not primarily after the fact imitations of the experience they recount. Rather, the intimate connection between story and experience results from the structure of action itself. I propose to view this dynamic as two coexisting bi-directional processes. And I'm really sorry that I didn't have the high tech available. I actually made a sketch, which you probably can't read, really, but you can see the arrows. Okay. <laughs> the idea is um, these these are parallel. They happen simultaneously. You have uh, sorry, can you, on this axis narrative in the middle, which allows a revision of the past and a redirecting of the future. And it goes both ways continuously, so I suppose it could also be cyclical. And on this axis, you have the body, with this side being the passive, active upon side, which is influenced usually negatively by trauma, but positively by the narrative process. And on this side, active agency acting into the world. Um, with that visual aid. <laughs> So um, I'm in the English department, so I just want to explain how this works in the novel. According to current clinical terminology, when the novel begins, Eva does not so much act out as act in, retreating from the world. She finds it difficult to venture into public. She feels like a fugitive, permanently exhausted with shame. She's found herself a derelict department so shabby and miserable that she feels it constitutes apt mockery of her life. She has little appetite, requires tranquilizers to sleep, and declines social invitations so that she needn't forego her evening ritual of chopping cabbage. She stays in Gladstone, where the family lived before Thursday, precisely because she's known and despised by the neighbors. She's decided to live where the ramifications of her life are fully felt. However, she does not seem inclined to injure herself, except in forcing herself to visit Kevin regularly in prison once a fortnight. At first, the reader may consider these visits a form of self-punishment. 
and initially Eva's fraught and bitter meetings with Kevin caused her excruciating pain. But gradually, through her persistence, Eva manages to get through to her son. The mother-son meetings become, or give rise to a testimonial dialogue which creates for Kevin the thou of which Dory Lau speaks. This thou enables repeating to become reworking until both Ava and Kevin move beyond their fury, guilt, and shame, overcome fidelity to trauma, and begin to foster hope for a new life trajectory. Ava thereby both accepts responsibility for her part in Thursday, which we're not going to detail today, and translates accountability into action, moving from the passive side of the axis to the active side. By forcing herself to act outside her narrative, to confront Kevin face to face, Eva becomes instrumental in allowing Kevin to reassess his own life. The most crucial aspect of this enforced intimacy is the disintegration of all pretense. Eva confesses in her letters to Franklin that she was ambivalent about parenthood from the start and developed feelings of resentment towards her son before he was even born. Since she could never admit to such misgivings, Kevin was born into a lie. Eva understands that, this, that his disturbing behavior must be, at least in part, a response to her thinly veiled hostility towards him. But the question of whether or not this hostility can explain her suspicion that Kevin was born, I quote, overflowing with malice, spiteful indifference, and congenital meanness, is not conclusively resolved. It's part of Schreiber's narrative strategy to maintain some uncertainty as to whether Kevin was innately twisted or was mangled by his mother's coldness. Despite her guilt and regret, Eva knows that she cannot be held responsible for Kevin's terrifying cruelty and violence. No one can explain the gap between his often justified resentment and his heinous crimes. But the insights gained through writing force Eva to recognize that she and Kevin share an understanding that she resisted for years. Along with a refined sense of irony, attention to detail, and subtlety of understanding, Kevin has inherited from Eva a heightened sensitivity to artifice. I haven't time to trace the evolution of this realization today, but I do want to note that Kevin's characteristic apathy seemed to her for 18 years, and this is her son, to epitomize their irreconcilable attitudes to life. Eva's narrative leads her to see that Kevin's impenetrable pose is an extension of her own dissembling. After Thursday, a civil suit for parental neglect is issued against her. The newspaper reports Eva's expression in her trial as an impassive mask radiating stony implacability. Eva explains to Franklin that this mask was a front, a defense against tears. But it's only through writing her narrative that she realizes for the first time that the studied indifference Kevin has always presented outwardly is also a mask, just like hers. Not only has Kevin been aware all along of her hostility towards him, but her very means of dissembling have taught him to pretend effectively. At that moment, a gestalt occurs. She's able to see Kevin in a different light. She not only conceives of his attitude as a fabrication, she also begins to understand the basis of his rage against the world. Again, we don't have time to develop into the reasons today, but I think it's important to note that Thursday required meticulous planning and remarkable accuracy in execution, all of which testify to appreciation of intelligence, foresight, purity, and other qualities of which he has learned from Eva. When towards the end of the novel Kevin is interviewed on national TV, Ava is shocked to discover that the only image decorating the wall of his prison cell is a picture of her. She's even more surprised at the protective tone with which he speaks of her. We discover that underneath it all, Kevin has always admired his brittle, judgmental, and shrewd mother and has tried in his own warped way to live up to her standards. Looking back, Ava can see that on the few occasions she allowed herself to be honest with Kevin, she was rewarded. Once, when he was six, she became so incensed with him that she threw him across the room. She was horrified to discover that his arm was broken. She was even more horrified to discover that he was evidently pleased. Later, when they discuss this day in prison, Kevin says, I was proud of you, most honest thing you've ever done. 
after Thursday ever drops all pretense, and it seems that her honesty is that which enables Kevin to finally be honest with himself and realize the extent to which his life has been a fabrication. So to conclude, Eva's soul-searching narrative continually surprises her by revealing aspects of her own life that she had understood differently beforehand. This is the narrative arrow, which unfortunately I don't have time to talk about today, but I'm glad to speak about it later. Um, so, sorry, so that's the narrative aspect. Her visits to Kevin perform a similar function for him. Crucially, however, the process of obsessing, dissecting, and articulating a testimonial narrative of Thursday is conducted together. The reevaluating of their lives before and after this traumatic event is a collaborative project. It is, in fact, the first time in their lives that they have cooperated in any way. At the time they least expect to feel connected, after the unforgivable has come between them, this shared processing leads them to reach out to one another. Although this is a novel, and so Ava's experiences are necessarily fictional, Shriver's treatment of Ava's post-traumatic processes relate in many interesting ways to those described by current empirical studies. I have a great deal to say about the ways in which this novel challenges the limits of readers' empathetic and moral scopes. But my focus today has been the means by which the novel suggests that for a survivor to feel truly integrated into the post-trauma world, the process of narrative creation, of testimony, must be accompanied by both intersubjective discourse and reciprocal interaction. Thank you, Naomi. So we have um, another kind of discourse, um, testimony discourse. Comments, questions? Just a comment that uh, your analysis coincides with the most recent understanding of what uh, has recently is being termed as post-traumatic growth. For the past 10 years, there is a vast literature in this direction, contrary to what we conceived of post-trauma as an incurable and an, uh, inconceivable. Now there is, I mean, for 10 years or more, there is a vast, this kind of uh, literature and research. Uh, what is very interesting is your conclusion, which uh, again uh, really depicts the, the most pertinent issues of what we understand clinically uh, about how uh, a trauma can be dealt with, especially when it turns to be a post traumatic entity. And I think it's fantastic how you. You managed to describe it out I'm the very rewarded by today altogether. I was speaking to Rivka <laughs> after her talk. The, the panel this morning, which was fascinating in my view, um, exactly, I felt that the, 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 the parallels, the intersections between this clinical research and I, mean, I reached these insights thanks to Shriver, she's the genius, but mm -hmm. it always, it's always delightful for somebody in the literature department to feel that the artists knew this, they had the insight before the clinical evidence was available. But it's also very rewarding for a clinical psychologist to say, yes, this is how it works, because especially with Kevin, and again, okay. I, I made, I, I had to decide if I was going to give a summary of the plot, and really, some really devastating things happened in this novel, and I have deliberately not mentioned them, but um, some people, therefore, particularly in literature, read it as a kind of uh, sub-genre of horror. It, it's sort of like a Stephen King. It, it's not. It's not conceived as being realistic, and uh, and my response to it, and I'm very glad that psychologists' response to it is that unfortunately, it's uh, it's scarily, again, obviously not real, but close to how people really think and behave. So yes, thank you very much. And another issue just to raise is that our understanding when at the beginning of the process of the trauma there are no words. Often we imply technique of non-verbal or 
transferring to actions. Actually, it was taught in the Yom Kippur War, when we use uh, gymnastic drills and, and other action. In other, in other words, to turn it into, into action. And I was very glad uh, to realize that you, and even in your sketch, uh, uh, mentioning the issue, the issue of of action as part of this uh, self healing. Yes, I actually in the book that's coming out. Let me plug, please. Uh, is that is one of the main focuses, exactly, because the, the, the claim is that particularly when there are, are conscious levels of resistance that prevent us from wanting to understand or relate uh, to multiple issues, one of the ways of accessing is th directly through the body. So the, not only are there multiple, there are therapies of this kind, but in my book is about drama, it's saying actually sitting and watching a play about it, because it affects the body on multiple levels, can instigate these responses. and. The, the whole use of language, testimony, discourse is a secondary process that has to be begun with the body. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Um, I'd like to ask, um, what do you make out of the fact that this is fiction? Because um, I had the feeling that you were, or I'm not sure, are you verifying psychological theory with that novel, or are the theories verifying the novel, or, um, I mean, okay. could you say something yeah. about that? Um, you no, know, it's very interesting, and again, uh, one has to decide what, to what topic one's going to focus. I decided that I wouldn't stand up here and defend literature. I talk about it, but I'm very happy to do so. Yes, I don't think that's what you we're doing. What gen my field generally is called cognitive approaches to literature, and, and this I'm actually new to trauma, and I, and I don't have enough background in the field, so I was a bit apprehensive about coming here. But but in terms of uh, the of using science and literature together, I, I have a great deal to say. And what we are trying to do is not um, justify the humanities by saying now we have evidence, right? Or saying uh, people and the scientists need us in order to represent what we're doing. What we're hoping to do is say, not everybody, but many people from many disciplines are trying to work out how we think, how we feel, how cognition works, what the base of epistemology may be, why we're attracted to art, how we can express ourselves in literature. Um, all these questions are actually better understood if you have different experts from different fields contributing their knowledge to the same question. So I'm saying people in psychology are thinking about this, people in neurobiology are thinking about this, uh, people in cognitive sciences, which I didn't talk about today, are thinking about this. And then, of course, artists and, and writers are thinking about this. So we have that much in common because we are all human, because we all think, because we all feel, because, unfortunately, most of us experience trauma. So uh, I'm, I'm trying to show that these complement and enrich and supplement one another rather than... Uh, giving um, more weight to one. But it goes back again to um, the argument of uh, science departments generally think literature is great, but we, uh, we often find ourselves trying to explain why there is even such a department at university, but I, I feel that no, there are... This is not the question. Okay. Uh, my question was more about the specificity of literature. In the specificity is about entering the human... I call it psyche, not soul, but the, the, the point is and not only uh, focusing on literature as something that's interesting because you can analyze metaphors, although, again, there's a lot of huge body of research now about language being based on the body itself, so that the, the, the notion that there can be a separation between body and mind is an illusion. The notion that there is a, really a separation between embodied and discursive processes has been collapsed. Because, again, I don't have time to talk about this now, but the the the... the the post-postmodern, in my view, will be characterized by this new understanding of embodiment. Okay, this new understanding that all human cognition is connected in that way, and and this separation into different disciplines has actually, m most of the time, uh, dis disadvantageous to us. I'm not answering your question. You don't look satisfied. I was wondering if you had 
Uh, maybe I will continue the question of civil. It's not really a matter of making separation, but at the moment that you put a testimony into a fiction, it's something else. So what happened with that? Uh, especially when we are now trying to think about, uh, about uh, testimony discourses in terms of genre. So, I mean, when we, are, when we introduce something very real or very close to what happened in our daily life or human experience into fiction, the contract is different. And we have to take it into account. It's something yes. else. It's proximal. It might be the same question when we are talking about history and fiction, you know? I mean, at the moment that you put something in another place, everything has changed. So what do you do with that? Okay. I, first of all, I, I agree completely. Second, again, in the, in the longer article version of this, there is a lot of close reading and analysis of literature. That I, that I left out of this, also because I assumed that almost no one except for, thankfully, Rivka has read this book. But um, um, it's, I'm, my view is not to study it as a study case. Right? I'm, I'm not treating it as if these people were real or their situation is real, even though it's based on situations in life that are very, very similar. But obviously, as I say, even the, the author in this case didn't experience a trauma of this kind. So it's not even second degree, it's completely fictional. And uh, the whole approach to it, therefore, is different. And I think the function is different, because it, it's not about um, testifying to the event. It's, it's exactly the opposite of the previous lecture, of saying, how, how am I going to make sure people know that this happened and didn't forget it? The function is completely different. It's trying to see how do I express, how do I get into this so that it's clear, first of all, it's an emotional experience for the reader. You can't ever experience what the traumatic subject experiences. It's an emotional exercise, but also an aesthetic exercise. So, again, I, I think they're both valid. They don't, they don't cancel each other out. It's certainly, I, I don't... It's not a matter of anything. No, but I'm saying I, I wouldn't possibly claim, again, that this, this is, uh, th that this requires the same kind of research or the same kind of discourse as, as, a, as a real trauma or, or real persons. Yeah, I think we have a uh, comment yeah, and question back there. Um, yeah. um, we need the mic, though. There's some aspect now coming up which weren't on our radar the last days. We were talking about um, the, the, the side of the victim of the testimony. So the person who um, was victim was victim who has experienced some, some, some bad experience. And we talked a little bit about the surrounding where, where someone can testify. But now we are on the side of reception. And that's a very interesting point. We have to talk about reception the moment we're talking about fictional texts. Because then we start to ask, why? Why are writing a book like that? And I think you're totally right. Um, say it's the same with the book you talked about. There is some sort of... Literature can be a laboratory to, to try to, 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 to talk about things which might happen in nature and in reality. I didn't, perhaps. So, so that's one side. But the other side, you mentioned some read it as a horror story, which is really interesting. A telltale a remark, I think, because there's another side to the reception that's indulging the horror. It's enjoying the horror. And that's a very strong aspect we never talked about. But that is a point of pornography, enjoying horror, enjoying testimonies. So it's like having a shiver and you read the book about a woman being raped a couple of times and ooh, it's, it's nasty, but that's reality to a large extent, I think. And now here we have a book which is exactly some sort of a ver on the verge of both aspects. And that's on one side really some insight into traumatic experiences, even to an extent where the pathologists might say, yeah, that's right, that's what we are describing. On the other hand, there might be in reception the re reflex to say, oh, lovely horror story. That's just a comment on the question. Yeah, I just, again, want to reiterate that uh, most of the stuff I do, I work on drama, and so that the connection between um, science and literature, it, it connects in the live bodies of real people on stage. And so most of what I do is rather different. This is a, a novel, so, but also, as I say, I'm, I'm open to, to anything people want to tell me, because as I say, I'm, I'm certainly new to trauma theory, and 
I know most of you know more about this than I certainly do. But thank you for all your questions. Thank you. I think I think all the panelists and the discussion, I think identifying points of convergence and, and divergence between these different uh, discourses of testimony has been productive. Thank you, Steve.